what a day, what, what a week and what a month to be looking at these myriad challenges that are facing Asia, geopolitical, economic, uh, trade and business. You know, this is a week and a month where we've already seen the US double down again on a fourth round of tariffs. We've had the China, China end up back on the currency manipulator bad books, uh, which we didn't really expect to see this time around. And global markets have reacted and central banks are on a race to the bottom again. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine a more apt time to gather around our esteemed speakers today and for Asia Society to try and make sense of where we go from here and the implications for this region. I want to hear from the neighbourhood perspectives, Danny, as you said, but I wanted to pick up on where you started and where you concluded your remarks, which is this is beyond trade. This is the great strategic competition of our time. And a lot of people have been saying this since the very beginning. This is not just about the trade balance. In that context, if this is a longer term thing, a lot of analysts are saying it's going to go beyond the 2020 elections. It's not just about an election win for President Trump anymore. What does a circuit breaker even look like? Well, um, Heidi, I think uh, there are two ways of answering that, um, short term and long term. Uh, in the short term, the uh, circuit breaker that would stop the um, accelerating uh, descent in the U.S.-China relations would be a trade deal. And the trigger for a trade deal would be political, not economic. And it would fundamentally be, in my view, in Washington, not in Beijing. Uh, China has wanted a trade deal, albeit a modest one, um, since... Uh, Donald Trump began uh, touting tariffs. Uh, China and the Communist Party greatly values stability and abhors turbulence. Uh, now, the content of a deal uh, is getting harder and harder to uh, establish uh, as the space, political space for compromise, sh shrinks in the face of uh, pressure. But I think the real value variable is in uh, Washington and is political, namely, at what point does President uh, Trump decide that um, it's more politically advantageous uh, to declare victory and to hold up a, uh, an agreement with China as a triumph, even if the content is uh, modest, uh, or, uh, you know, for how long will it be good politics for him to... Uh, cast himself as the warrior battling with the sort of malevolent forces of China. Um, I think uh, that it's reasonable to expect that as the holiday season approaches in the United States, and particularly uh, if on September 1st the next tranche of sanctions comes into force, uh, the direct impact not only on American consumers uh, but on American retailers and uh, sectors beyond agriculture and energy will be such that uh, when President Trump does that calculation, he's going to decide, um, I'm better off with a deal even if, the, if that deal is uh, not very impressive. The longer term uh, question of, about a circuit breaker is much harder to find because uh, there's no easy way to climb back to a uh, relationship of mutual respect and comedy between uh, Washington and Beijing. Uh, attitudes have really, really hardened, and a tremendous amount of trust has been lost. The, you know, the, the secret ingredient to a uh, more stable and healthier future is going to have to be a recognition that competition and cooperation can and must coexist in a uh, U.S.-China environment, that it cannot simply be a matter of uh, the U.S. containing or seeking to crush uh, China. It can't be a matter of China seeking to exclude and diminish uh, the U.S. or to uh, run roughshod over the uh, international rules-based uh, system. Uh, there is going to have to be a balance struck if we have, are to avoid a you know, tremendously dangerous downward spiral. Ambassador Takahashi, there's, you know, you've spoken about ASEAN being 
at the core of any kind of centralized structural vision for, for a norms-based rule system for the region. I mean, how does Japan then position itself as one of the economies that have been has been most vulnerable to the impact of the deterioration of sentiment and the deterioration of economic data? Um, let me start with uh, slightly different stories. Uh, suppose you are traveling, you are on board for your destinations, and you ask to fasten your seatbelt, and then something happens, warning signs lit, and then you are told, loosen your seatbelt and get away. And you talk to her, what a minute, wait a minute, you are in emergency, you are supposed to fasten your seatbelt. And the uh, attendant told me, sir, you are on board of a ship, not on a plane. <laughs> you see, uh, probably uh, we have to be reminded ourselves uh, out of my, our strategic context, which is clear, clear to identify, meaning of the rise of China and the meaning of the change in the U.S. politics and its implication on its presence on Asia and Pacific. But probably we are still wondering about whether we are on board of a ship or a plane to respond, whether we loosen our seatbelt or fasten your seatbelt. Uh, your seat, seat uh, from this angle, I think we are all should be reminded what we learned 74 years ago at the end of the war. We created the liberal and multilateral open system as a basis for our economic prosperity. And that's what we uh, are based on. And uh, we would like to remind our neighbor, especially our friends in China, that that is also a basis for your economic prosperity. That China's rise comes from the benefits they get from the open and multilateral trading system, their participation in WTO, and the globaliz globalization of the economy uh, get, gets a lot of benefit to the Chinese rise. So uh, it is only natural that the people in China, over one billion people, has their own dream. But dream should be based on a realistic as assessment of what is the cause of the rise in the past. And I hope this uh, idea should be shared by our Asian neighbors. And if there is a, one important role Japan should play is to try to remind this lesson to our Asian neighbors. The problem is that for, for a very long time, the stance from Beijing has seemed very black and white. You are either with us or you're against us. You're either part of RCEP or you're a member of TPP. You must choose a side if you want the economic benefits. And Australia finds itself in this very position, right? I'm curious, uh, Dr. Leitu, from the perspective of Vietnam, it's one of the countries that has taken a strong stance against the territorial activities of China in the South China Sea, the encroachment along you know, what it calls the Nine Dash Line, if you will. Does that make things problematic in terms of how Vietnam finds itself conflicted? Well, I think Vietnam, um, like many other countries, including Australia, but many uh, regional countries, finds itself in a situation of old challenges, with meaning uh, the territorial disputes, the uh, pressure from the bigger uh, neighbor, pressure from China, but uh, also, again, great power competition that um, uh, Danny mentioned in the earlier um, speech today, but also new challenges. Uh, new challenges including the forms of coercion from China, for example, and I'll get to that in a, in a minute. But um, for me, what is very challenging for Vietnam is that it is uh, in a position only learning how to integrate into the international system. It was uh, pushed to open up it was, has been trying to open up. And if it, I remember that, if I remember that, that all the leaders uh, um, in Vietnam have even harder time right now to go back to potentially a world of close boundaries and close uh, and challenges to the international trade system. So I think there are um, multiple challenges um, thrown at Vietnam as, as well as many middle-sized countries that are there, it's really hard uh, to, to focus on, on one challenges. Um, it, one of the way that traditionally Vietnam thought was how to balance China is to uh, get along better with, with the U.S. And it has been a process that cost a lot of adjustment uh, among the, the uh, political leaders in Vietnam. Um, it, it didn't come easy, uh, but at, the, at this moment, uh, Vietnam only found itself um, you know, benefiting from trade war uh, for a couple of weeks uh, uh, before uh, facing the same problem of being targeted.
targeted um, um, by tariffs. So actually, Bloomberg uh, uh, covered the story, and one, one month apart, one article came in June saying Vietnam is the biggest uh, beneficiary uh, of the trade war. And in July, the same date in July was um, well, the, the benefit didn't didn't last too long. So there, there is uh, there is this really challenging situation with the relationship with the United States at the moment, where um, I think on many levels it is very much improving. It is uh, quite a huge trajectory in terms of defense and security relations, but in terms of economic um, relations, and it's hard, really hard to, uh, to predict what are the decisions coming from the White House uh, in, in regard to trade. And, and in, in the situation um, of countries like Vietnam, the economic health, is really something that it needs to be strong to be able to sustain pr pressure uh, coming from a large, much larger neighbor like China, for example. Yeah. It's also a question of, I think, regional leadership of who's going to step up, right? And I'm curious, Ambassador Lagoa, given that we're going into President Jokowi's second term, his first term and his entire campaign platform was very much a people-centric focused, if you will, on the outcomes domestically. Do you think in his second term that there's a greater confidence and I guess more of a space where he can focus on becoming more of a regional leader and having a greater, stronger foreign policy? Well, I think the basic tenet of the conduct of the Indonesian foreign policy will remain the same. Mm. Uh, we have to be independent, we have to be more active, and we will be fully guided by our national interests. And I believe, uh, and also we have to be more active also in uh, addressing issues uh, that will affect the ecosystem of um, security, stability, and uh, ecosystem of uh, security, stability, that is very fundamental to us. I would like to add also uh, to, to answer uh, the questions, the big questions that has been uh, posed by Daniel at the beginning of his remark, what the hell is going on now in our region? <laughs> and of course, uh, I made a list. Uh, Daniel has mentioned uh, very eloquently also about what, hap what is happening in Korean Peninsula, all despite the spark of hope generated by the talk between President Trump and uh, North Korean leader. But we have to be ready uh, for any implications of, of all of a breakdown. And of course, South China Sea uh, issues will remain in our agenda in the conduct of our foreign policy, although we are not claiming uh, to, to, that, uh, to that area. But I believe that that will affect the, the Asia uh, political landscape in 2019. But there's something that has not been mentioned since this morning. Uh, the non-traditional threat like terrorism, people smuggling, I believe that this will continue posing big threat to the ecosystem of stability, security, and peace in our region. And we are lucky that in dealing with this issue, we have a strong partner, Australia. Together with Australia and many countries in the region, I think we have a very strong collaboration because from the very beginning, uh, we believe that no single nation could cope with this issue alone. It has become transnational, so we need to beef up the, our collaborations, in particular in dealing with this issue. So there needs to be greater ASEAN cooperation. And I suppose, you know, in that context, the comprehensive partnership agreement is more crucial than ever in this environment. Definitely, yes. I think it's not only between Indonesia and Australia, but also in uh, between ASEAN and Australia. And as if you follow also the result of the ASEAN-Australia summit last year, I think we specifically uh, focus uh, on this particular issue in dealing with uh, terrorism. It feels like every time we gather for one of these conversations, we talk about being, you know, on the on the brink. Um, I, it feels like this week feels <laughs> somewhat more serious, and the, and the stakes just keep going up. And I'm wondering on this idea of, of this is a moment in time where you can see leadership or you can see 
further aggression. Danny, is there a moment where Beijing can, can kind of look at this as a moment to show leadership, whether it be in the way it responds economically or whether it be in the way that it responds to the pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong? It, I think, depends really on uh, what Beijing uh, pursues by way of an objective of that leadership. Because leadership is not using your power, wealth, and force to compel and coerce obedience from others around you. Leadership is inspiring others to want to align themselves with you because they believe that you're pursuing a cause that ultimately takes their interests into account and provides uh, larger shared benefits. So the fact is, no, I'm not seeing what meets at least my definition of leadership in most respects from either of the uh, two major powers at this moment. Um, if the China dream, as I said, if the, if the global uh, perspective of China is in fact uh, ultimately very Sinocentric, uh, then, uh, you know, that kind of leadership is going to be treated with uh, caution by uh, other third countries. Now, there are uh, endless opportunities that Beijing can and is taking advantage of uh, to occupy decision-making space and to seize the agenda, in some cases, uh, by actively participating in uh, international or multilateral organizations that the United States has backed away from. Uh, and we saw that at the East Asia Summit, for example. And we see it in the WTO or in other fora. Um, it's also visible in an effort to create new and standalone and sometimes rival uh, organizations. Uh, now, uh, I think a happy example is that of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank which started out as a very troubling black box uh, with no detail, no uh, transparency that looked to become a simple instrument of uh, Chinese national interests uh, competing directly and perhaps undermining with the Asian Development Bank or the IMF and so on. And through a combination of factors by international partners, some of whom, like the U.S. and Japan and Australia, were hands-off. Uh, others of whom joined in but worked from within to make adjustments. The AIIB ultimately evolved into something eminently uh, credible, although it hasn't yet loaned a dime to any Belt and Road projects, but that's another story. Um, that's the trajectory that I think uh, the world would like to see in Chinese leadership. But... So far, it seems to be the exception, not the, uh, not the rule. What role then for middle countries, if you will, like Australia, I guess to an extent, to Japan as well, when you're in this situation where you don't want to believe that it is a binary choice, but at the end of the day, perhaps you do have to align yourself between what is your biggest trading partner and what is your traditional ally? Um, uh, on this issue, I would like to stress the importance of the adoption of ASEAN in the Pacific outlook, uh, which has uh, recently been adopted. I think uh, this is a very productive way ASEAN is able to play a role. Uh, Japan supports the centrality of ASEAN in dealing with the issue of the security of the region and the freedom of navigations. Now, uh, United States, Japan, India... ASEAN and Australia has their own vision of uh, freedom and the prosperity of the uh, Indo-Pacific region, open and free of the Indo-Pacific region. So now uh, we are reaching to the stage how we translate this vision into the reality. And of course, uh, the important objectives we are pursuing, which we can share, is the uh, uh, need to maintain uh, um, rule, of, rule, rule of law, uh, freedom of navigation in the region. Uh, on this specific issue, we have a concern about the voice coming from Beijing that the issue related to South China Sea can only be dealt with by the claimants, which we do disagree, because the South China Sea is an open sea lanes for many countries. And, Ambassador, uh, you pointed out the importance of the uh, untraditional threat uh, posing to that region. That necessitates the wider participation and discussion 
among the countries uh, to ensure the uh, uh, prosperity and freedom of a South, uh, you know, South, South China Sea. That's one thing. Another thing is the a good example is the role played by the Australia and Japan jointly take initiative to make TPP-11 alive. Um, you know, everybody thought when the United States decided to pull out, uh, the fate of the TPP was dead, uh, which was wrong. Uh, by the initiative taken by uh, Japan and Australia and the co cooperation with the other members of the TPP, TPP is alive. And now we are seeing more countries are willing to join us. So, you know, uh, with, even with a given context, the very harsh uh, uh, strategic competition between United States and China, there are a role to be played by, the, by the, what we call the middle powers. Should China be welcomed into TPP? Um, you know, uh, the important thing is to send the right message to China what TPP is all about, what we can do about it. TPP is not really on the issue of uh, tariffs and trade liberalization. TPP is all about making the rules for the future on investment, protection the environment, labor, uh, uh, labor laws and protections, all those stuff which can be, which can be a defining uh, factor for our future economic creations. And if we can send the right message to Beijing, I think there are factors that Beijing can be available. Okay. At this point, uh, I'd like to bring up our audience question before I forget. So if I can get everyone to get onto your smartphones. And we've got a question today which is talking about the idea of China's influence rapidly growing in Southeast Asia and the South Pacific uh, through things like Belt and Road, aid, investment, military power, debt. What should Australia do? Should Australia push back and assert our sovereign position or to accept that this is the reality of China's rising power and try to work with it for Australia's own economic benefit? So we'll show the uh, results very evenly split at this point. We'll show the results at the end of the session. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Dr. Leitu, I'm curious, in your experience as a defence expert, when you have a situation where a, a superpower or a burgeoning superpower like China isn't doing very well in the trade war, does that increase the risk of a more hawkish, aggressive response on other fronts? Uh, I think trade is only one of the issues that might increase that hawkish uh, uh, attitude. I think um, the, the overview that Danny gave earlier is really explaining um, a lot of about what is happening in China, including the domestic uh, pressure, uh, how to react to Hong Kong protests, how to react to the upcoming uh, Taiwan election, and also um, improving Taiwan's relations with the U.S., but also um, really pressure uh, within the domestic po um, uh, dom politics uh, towards Xi Jinping. So uh, there, there is um, a view in, in the region for a, lot, a long time that uh, when there is internal pressure, there are likelihood uh, growing that China will try to um, transmit that pressure outside. So one of the one of the explanation of current stand of for example with South China Sea in Vietnam with with the Vietnamese uh, exclusive economic zone again brings back to that that um, bringing the, this uh, bringing up this national sentiment might uh, try to unify uh, otherwise very stressed domestic um, uh, population in, in, in China. Um, trade is, is, is another um, issue because it's not that easily manipulated in terms of um, because you have data and it affects the economics. Uh, um, I'm yet to, to see. I, I, don't, I don't have a verdict uh, on the outcome and how China will re, uh, react to, um, to uh, the escalations. We do see some uh, indications, uh, but really it is also quite um, um, responsive and reactive to what President uh, Trump is doing. And in one, one view is that Trump is doing well in surprising China. Is that something that uh, Xi Jinping and, and, and the Chinese leadership doesn't like too much, to be surprised constantly uh, and, and, and can't not really uh, man maneuver without a really, uh, uh, you know, a very clear pathway. So this, uh, despite, um, you know, a lot of tensions, a lot of anxiety, I should say, 
in the region of smaller economies about the trade wars. This has been also um, uh, seen as a way uh, uh, of strategic response to China that it is able to surprise China. What about the anxiety of the other major geopolitical threat in the region, which, Danny, you know, you mentioned is, are we making any progress on North Korea, given that we've seen recently another spate of ballistic missile tests? Has this, you know, more carrot than stick kind of appeasement strategy failed? Uh, the strategy that succeeded is Kim Jong-un's strategy. <laughs> Kim Jong-un's strategy is to get the world uh, acclimated uh, to the notion that it is utterly intransigent uh, when it comes to uh, its defiant uh, production of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles, that this is absolutely hopeless and that the best we can hope for is to be able to rent some peace and quiet. Uh, and uh, the problem with that, which... I mean, to put it bluntly, as a form of uh, extortion, is that the rent keeps going up. Uh, I mean, we've done this before. And, you know, I've negotiated uh, with the North Koreans, in fact, in the mid-'90s, successfully as part of the team that arrived at an agreed framework between the U.S. and North Korea. Uh, there's not a lot of mystery about their strategy. Uh, they consider themselves to be... Uh, handicapped by size, by geography, uh, but uh, enhanced by their cult-like ideology and their absolute determination to defy the international system and international law. Uh, what has changed dramatically is that the unity of the international community has shattered and that China and uh, Russia and, frankly, to some extent, the Republic of Korea uh, are, in effect, siding with uh, North Korea in this notion that, well, let's, let's pay them off, let's give them things to make them happy. If we can get Kim Jong-un in a good mood, uh, then maybe he won't launch a wep a mass weapons of mass destruction uh, our way. Uh, that's a you know, profoundly flawed line of reasoning, but it is eminently in keeping with uh, Kim Jong-un's own uh, strategic plan. Yeah. Um, uh, I was in New York before I came to Australia, and few people know there is still a small office outside New York called the KEDO, K-E-D-O, I won't explain what abbreviation it is because it's a four-letter word for me. <laughs> the, this is the legacy of a failed negotiation. You know, uh, Japanese and American taxpayers spent uh, quite millions of dollars to provide with a nuclear reactor to North Korea, mm -hmm. which ended up with virtually nothing. So uh, we should be reminded that negotiation <laughs> with North yeah. Korea needs a lot of patience and the negotiation has to be grounded on the concrete actions, not words. Uh, that's one thing. I'm aware that we're running short on time. Uh, I'd like to open it up to the audience, though. Doug? I'd like to ask a question. Uh, it's quite old school, but uh, Danny, if the, uh, if, the, uh, if the America first uh, strategies is followed through from your discussion and the circuit breaker is a, a trade deal between the US and China. Would you care to comment on what that might mean for Australia given that we export coal and barley and agricultural food products to China as well? Well, um, if to the extent that a trade deal goes beyond uh, Chinese commitment to uh, restore or even increase uh, imports from the United States of products like you know, agricultural products, energy products, and the like. To the extent that the agreement entails provisions that get at some of the structural obstacles, uh, the non-tariff barriers to trade that all international uh, firms have had to contend with as best they could, uh, the use of regulations, the support for national champions uh, and state-owned enterprises, 
uh, trade distorting industrial subsidies and uh, restrictions on investment, uh, the coercive tr forced transfer of technology from foreign firms as the price of doing business in China and so on. If the ultimate agreement uh, can make a dent in these areas, then that obviously, I think, uh, works uh, directly to the benefit of all of China's uh, foreign trading partners, and particularly of uh, a country like Australia, which is such a, a big exporter. Um, you know, it, it, I think, unfortunately, the logic is that um, the moment, the golden moment when uh, China would have given the most uh, in return for the least from the United States in a trade deal is long since passed. Uh, that the Trump administration, in my view, uh, overplayed their hand, overshot the mark, and now, unfortunately, uh, the uh, compromises politically that Xi Jinping could make in the economic uh, arena, particularly when, with regard to uh, economic reforms uh, and structural improvements, uh, is diminishing uh, rapidly. So it, I think it will be uh, less for less, ultimately, in the deal. But um, there will be those sorts of benefits as well as uh, a truce, albeit probably a temporary truce, uh, in the kind of battle of chainsaws, this artillery match of just inflicting a, a pain on the other side that has a very negative spillover effect on third countries like Australia, or Vietnam, Indonesia, and Japan. Hedy, can I uh, just uh, ask a quick question to uh, Ambassador Takashi and Daniel also? So in this current circumstances, is there still any possibility for us to revive the six-party uh, talk mechanisms in dealing with the Korean Peninsula? <laughs> the, it was the North Koreans who uh, declared the six-party talks dead in 2008 and who steadfastly resisted the efforts by President Obama and other leaders to try to reconstitute it. Um, so that not only uh, remains but has intensified uh, North Korea's strong biases in favor of divide and conquer and they have been uh, so successful uh, at this point that it's hard to imagine uh, what circumstances would induce them to uh, group together but when you look at it the prospects of getting uh, Japan and South Korea in the same room let alone uh, working in tandem albeit in a common interest, have gone down, not gone up. Uh, China f clearly felt shocked and betrayed by the surprise announcement by President Trump that he was going to meet with uh, Kim Jong-un in Singapore, notwithstanding the fact that the North Koreans had made absolutely no concessions or steps in the direction of complying with international law, nor had the U.S. given China even the courtesy of prior warning. And so it understood understandably appeared from Beijing as if the US was playing a trick on China by trying to get it uh, insert itself into Pyongyang and uh, to the detriment of uh, of China uh, Russia and the US are at uh, swords drawn uh, so when you sort of pick it apart uh, the prospects of getting the five parties together let alone the six party uh, six parties together um, looks pretty close to zero. <laughs> um, in my personal opinion, Ambassador, North Korea may try to go for the another option when their negotiation with the United States either when, when goes very well or uh, absolutely desperate uh, the way to failure. Then they may think of other options to go for it. Uh, for the time being, I don't think a uh, negotiation between U.S. and North Korea hasn't reached that stage. For Japan, uh, we all know we have an uh, issue of abduction. Could you imagine 13 years old girl on her way back from home to uh, school to home was abducted by North Korean operatives more than you know, uh, several decades ago? 
and there is still no answer for our question. They send, they send us an answer, she, she's already dead, but they send back a fake bones. So this is really a serious human rights issues that we have to deal with, uh, with, with North Korea. I just would like to point out there is a serious issues of a human rights violation between our two countries. A question here. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm Dick Walcott. As somebody mentioned earlier, I'm the founding director. But uh, uh, Daniel, I'd like to uh, ask Daniel to make a comment on something which you said. You did refer to the um, rules-based order and said that this was an. Uh, but what I think is not always clear is this was a order defined solely and only by the United States without any consultation with any other country. And Daniel, you also referred for the uh, desirability of connectivity, but there was no connecti connectivity on this issue. Could you comment a little further on that? Yes, gladly. So, um, first and foremost, let's recall the San Francisco Treaty that created the United Nations and the uh, Security Council and uh, the basic template. Um, so, I, I don't accept that the uh, post-war order was uh, created in isolation or exclusively by the United States. It was really a function of uh, common vision among uh, the allies. Um, nevertheless, it's fair to say that the Chinese Communist Party was not a uh, participant in the design in, uh, in 1944, 45, etc. No, no question about that. And that the decisions that were made in 1945 reflect uh, a number of uh, prejudices flowing from the, the state of that era the enemies clause in the charter, um, the f absence of Japan or India or Germany from the UN Security Council as permanent members. Uh, uh, there are a lot of anomalies. And the relative power of China at the time versus today is so different that it looks like a flaw in the system. And in fact, it's been quite difficult for the multilateral system to move anywhere uh, nearly fast enough to make adjustments to changing geopolitical realities. But the issue is not which rule and who wrote which rule. The issue is order, the rules-based order. And what that means is that the same rule that binds little Brunei uh, or little Laos binds big Indonesia and strong Vietnam and even bigger and stronger Japan and biggest and strongest of all, the United States. That, that revolutionary concept that a, a, a country, a nation with, in the post-war period, uh, an unimaginably disproportionate share of global wealth and power should accept the principle that the rules are binding on all of us, even if the U.S. honored that in the breach sometime, is what we need to protect. I am a passionate believer and was in government and said, and I know that, and I heard President Obama say, uh, express this thought, that um, it is just and valid that China, as a rising power, have a seat at the table and a voice in modernizing and improving uh, the rules. But the price of admission is for China, like others, to accept that the rules are binding and they are not subject to some magical exemption when they approach a self-declared Chinese core interest, such as in the South China Sea or the East China Sea or Hong Kong, et cetera. So that, that's my um, heart, heartfelt view. Sadly, I think we've run out of time. Uh, just before we wrap up, I want to bring up the answer. <laughs> <laughs>
It seems like we've just all accepted the uh, <laughs> the new normal and we'll try to, to come to the party. Well, thank you so much to all of our panellists today. Of course, uh, Dr Hong Lei Tu from uh, joining us here today, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Lagoa, His Excellency Ambassador Takahashi, and of course, Danny Russell. Really great to have you all here with us. Thank you, Heidi.